The content of this podcast includes topics that may be difficult for some people to confront or discuss. These conversations can be triggering. If you are underage, please speak to your guardian before continuing. Welcome back to another episode of That's an Issue podcast. And this week, we delve into something that we kind of should have addressed before, marriage. Now, it's brought up in the episode. It's kind of interesting how you have to take all these tests in order and practice a lot in order to get a driver's license. But when you're a certain age, you kind of could just get married. No prep needed. And maybe there's something wrong with that. Maybe we do need more prep. Maybe there are certain tools that we could have in communication to really help us have better marriages. In walks Panina Fluke. And the Kleshiks sit down with her to discuss what are the steps we all can incorporate in our lives in order to have better marriages, in order to, uh, we might be single and listening to this and say, okay, now that I know I need to do X, Y, and Z and work on A, B, C, now I am more ready to get married. Without further ado, the Kleshiks and Panina Fluke. Mental health, relationships, those are loaded topics and something that affects every part of our lives. But we aren't having enough open conversations about it. And that's an issue. Welcome, Panina Flug, um, to our podcast. We're very excited to have you. Thank you. Could you just start with telling us what you do? And then we'll get into the topic we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, sure. So I, um, I do emotionally focused couples therapy. That's what I do all day mostly couples also parent with their adult children repairing relationships like um so I do that Uh, and recently I made it my mission to try to create awareness in our community about the importance of premarital education to prevent a lot of the problems that I see in my practice okay okay that's and also and it's also It's premarital education, but it's also marriage enhancement. Um, I tell the couples it's just as important to do it after the wedding or if you've been married for a few years, if you didn't do it before the wedding. So is this like college classes or something else? It's different. It's all about communication and the the aspects of a healthy relationship. So it should go with chassan and college classes. classes. I think engaged couples really need both. Like you, sh- you can't have one without the other, right? You really need both. So one's like law-based or like rule-based and the other one is more, you know, how to make that relationship work. Right. It's all about how to create a secure attachment with your spouse, a secure bond so that anything that comes up you can handle because you have a secure attachment. So do you want me to talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when couples come in to see me, regardless of what the problem is, if it's parenting, if it's money, if they're having difficulties with their in-laws, I always tell them we have to fix the foundation and then you can handle any problem. I'm not going to tell you what to do. What our approach, emotionally focused couples therapy, is it's not where we say go home and try this. It's we create the change in the room. We call it corrective emotional experience. So we do enactments where we change the communication and create safety. So in the room with 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 the therapist facilitating, the communication becomes safer, which means like you can talk to each other about things without the other one getting upset, with the other one being supportive, emotionally supportive, safe communication, so that the more that they do it in the therapy room, then when it, when it happens at home, it's easier to do it on their own. Got it. So both the couple is in the room with you doing this together? It's not a one-on-one? Yes, one. yes. And Got to it. give an example of an emotional safety, I always use this example. If you call Yoni and you say, I had a car accident, you want him to say, are you okay? Not, oh my gosh, what did you do this time? Or were you on the phone? Were you falling asleep? Like, we need, that's, right. that's support, right? Supportive. So what, what one thing I tell my engaged couples is the ABCs of a healthy relationship are acceptance, belonging, comfort, and safety, right? We all want to feel accepted by our spouse, even with mistakes. It's like caring about someone even when you're angry at them. Of course, all couples argue. Right. So when we see that in in therapy, when we know that a couple is de-escalated, like we've calmed down the fighting, they're not fighting as much when they can repair, when they can exit the negative cycle. All couples are going to argue. But what we don't want to see is what we see often when they start therapy, let's say, is 
they won't be able to talk about simple things without it turning into a fight, or they won't repair. They'll just not talk for a few days. That we don't want to see. We want to see healthy repairing because we all, everyone's going to have arguments. That's normal, right? Uh, interesting. Okay, so let me ask you something about the engaged okay, couples. Sure. Is it, do you find that it's actually effective? Okay, that's not what I meant to say. Is it effective to do it when you're only with an engaged couple and not to continue after they're married? Just because so many issues don't come out right. until after the marriage. Like when you're engaged, there's like this like blissful, everything's great, and you don't anticipate even the possibility of having a disagreement. That's a very good question. We talk about this a lot. So, if it's a couple that's new, like let's say they're getting married after knowing each other for a short time, like in our community, what I always recommend to them is let's meet one or two times before the wedding and then call me like a month or two after because a lot of the topics are theoretical. Right. right. If it's a couple that, you know, outside of our community, you know, where they're, they've known each other for years, then we, right. we do the whole thing before. But I really, I think it's so important, and this is something that I'm trying to get across, that while I'm saying we need to do premarital education and it's not counseling and that's very important it's premarital education it's psychoeducational it's for all, all couples need this it doesn't matter so it's important to do it before but it's just as important to do it after even if a couple's been married for a few years or, or many years I mean I'm I'm doing it with couples that have been married for 30 years and we call it marriage enhancement right so that wouldn't be you wouldn't call that education anymore you would, I would. Call that counseling no no or? if they don't if they don't want therapy but they just let's say they want to enhance their connection or they want to learn some skills that they never learned so they can still take marriage enhancement and it's the same course that I would teach engaged uh, couples or newly married couples interesting that's real okay so could you tell us a little bit about what's in that course yeah sure okay so the first part is all about attachment so I I teach them about what does it mean to have a healthy attachment, which we talked a little bit about having secure communication, having a foundation, right? Like we talk about a clothing line, right? So if the clothing line is secure and you throw things fall on it, it can stay secure. Right? But if it's broken, then every little thing and major traumas are going to really pull it apart. So we want to strengthen the foundation. We teach them how to bond, right? We talk about rituals for connection, like date nights or every day having a talk where you put your phone away and you actually listen. We talk a lot about listening because the art of listening doesn't come naturally mm -hmm. to most people, right? Um, we talk a lot about a lot about empathy, validation, and vulnerability, a lot about vulnerability. And also what, we, what I try to help them understand is how, like, what is their attachment style based on their own relationship with their parents? And what attachment style did they see when they're, you know, having an argument with their chassan or kala to help them understand. Because if we understand our attachment styles, it's, there's a lot of hope to change because we all have been through, we have all been through things in our life that impact us that might make it hard for us to trust or defensive. But if you understand it and you're willing to change it, it there's a lot of hope. Could you, could you give us the options of attachment styles? Yeah, so there's um, so the goal is secure attachment, right? But there's anxious attachment, avoidant attachment. So, so what would that look like? So, so let's say if someone, if someone has difficulty attaching to someone, let's say they're anxious, they're insecure. So they're never going to feel, they're always going to be doubting. Does the person really love me? Um, so like I'll give you an example. So sometimes we'll, I'll see like one partner in a marriage um in couples therapy where no matter what their spouse does they don't they can't feel love they can't take in the love so it's because let's say they were just hurt they never received love growing up so it's very hard for them to take it in and to accept it right whereas somebody who had a lot of love and they feel secure it's much easier mm -hmm. right so until someone learns how to attach they're gonna they'll struggle which is why it's helpful to understand your attachment style. But there's some, okay. <laughs> Wait, so that, that was the anxious option? Yeah. What and was the other Avoidant options? is like, will totally avoid attachment, right? Without even realizing it. And like shutting down, like right. if something happens, I'll shut down. Right. And like silent treatment. But how's that work with right? attachment? How's that right. an attachment? It's a way of attaching. Like sometimes in a, in a couple, when somebody will be yelling and screaming at someone. And really, that's their protest for connection. 
And the spouse is like, what do you mean? It sounds like she hates me. But really, that's her way of pursuing because she's, let's say, the person is so scared or can't take in love, right? And a lot of times the way we approach in, a, in an argument, we get the exact opposite of what we're looking for. Like if you're upset, like let's say, um, okay, I'll give an example. Like uh, um, a husband walks in and the wife is on the phone and there's no dinner and the house is a mess and and he might say something like you never you never do anything for me or you never do the laundry and that's what he's saying on the outside right but a lot of times what's really happening inside is he's feeling like he's not important or um not a priority so but he's not gonna it's very hard to be Mm -hmm. vulnerable and say you know my feelings are hurt when I come home and you're on the phone it's much easier to just say what's wrong with you Right. So, this, is, this is one of my favorite things, actually, that I learned in my, I took one marriage and family therapy class. This is my favorite thing. Tell me if I'm right. It's like turning the hard emotions into soft emotions. Yeah, yeah. Like we will say, we'll call it, it's like what, like, so, so to break down yeah. a negative cycle, what we, what I always ask people is first, like, what's, what does your partner see, right? When, when you're feeling disconnected. So that would be like anger, frustration, and then slowly we'll get to the more vulnerable primary emotions, which would be fear, abandonment, rejection. So for many people, it's really hard to be vulnerable. And that's why if you can take a class and learn, and like a real class with someone who's trained, you really can learn how to be vulnerable. Like, let's say some people, they think it's a weakness to ask for help. And that, and then, you know, or like some people, really have trouble sharing feelings like I just had an example with um with a parent and a child an adult parent and a child where um the parent was really like feeling for the child what the child was going through but the parent was not able to share feelings and the child had no idea that you know because some people just they can't they can't be vulnerable so if they can't do something let's say if they're far away like they can't show up and they can't express their feelings on the phone, then they can't connect. So, so many times people just expect their spouse to read their mind and they don't realize you have to say it. Like I'll say, did you apologize? No. And a lot of times couples will say that one doesn't, can't apologize. And an apology is not, I'm sorry. So what we teach as an apology is something like, I'm sorry that you must have felt so sad. You must have felt so hurt. Like recognizing what the person felt, right. not just I'm sorry, but like sort of what you're sorry Trying for. to walk in their shoes. Right. What did it feel like? Trying to really connect with what. And it's the same thing. It's like this is one of the main things that I see all the time. Uh, when couples first come to therapy, one will say um, something like, I'm really hurt. I feel like um, you come home from work. You come home from work so late. And then, and then once we have dinner, you're back at work again. And let's say the husband would answer with something like, I hear you, but. So right away, I'm like, wait, wait, wait let's slow this down, right? Because if you say but. Right. Or the opposite is, I hear you, but I just came home early last night, right? So then what happens to the other person? Their feelings are completely dismissed. And then if the person, if the person attacks, if they take that as an attack and they attack back, then it becomes about that, and the and and then what the partner learns is to not that it's not a safe place to share feelings. Right, like don't say anything that you're right. upset because I'm not going to get what I need. Right. So I mean, it, right? Okay, so now that we got into the like more of the counseling piece right. of what you do, can you tell us when would a couple decide to go? for counseling? Like, what do you see? Like, is it to a certain severity, I guess, the issues, right? Because everyone argues, everyone disagrees sometimes. But like, when would someone say like, I I should go for marriage counseling? Okay, so it's different for everyone. Unfortunately, a lot of people wait till there's so much distress, and they're depressed, or really not functioning well to get help. And that's part of what we're all trying to do, I right. think, all yeah, four of us. Yeah, on this podcast, for yeah, sure. Like yeah, like that there needs to be an awareness that everyone needs a therapist at some point in their life. I mean, right? Everyone needs a therapist. Let, we're, that's the best gift you can give your children and to yourselves, right? To If something's wrong, yeah. deal with it. It's Get an the investment help. in yourself. Right. I always help you I with mean, that. 
I always see couples that go through real trauma and then they go for therapy, the relationship is much better than it ever was if they didn't have a great relationship. I mean, some people come in after a trauma because they just are traumatized and they need help, but some couples will come in and they never had a secure attachment. So then once they go through therapy, they have a completely new relationship. So to answer your question, some cu most couples wait because there's such a stigma and we don't talk enough about it. And that's part of what I'm trying to do. I tell my couples, my engaged couples, everyone needs help. If you see something and, you, and you're a little bit concerned, call up. You know, And, and the, that's the other part of the premarital education is that I feel like if somebody comes for premarital education and then something's wrong, they'll say, hey, I, I spoke to that guy and he mm. was easy to talk to. I'll just give him a call. Like, like someone does with the point. college teacher. Do right. people get into grooves, you feel like? Is that like a challenge? Like so someone who get, starts off a certain way and then they continuously act in that way, whether not their fault or whatever, but does that is it harder to change, you know, their patterns? Do they, people get into patterns, basically? Is that why you're, we're, you know, the effort is made to do premarital so you kind of get that into a groove that's healthy? Yes. Definitely. I mean, it, that's usually what it ha what happens is that if you don't recognize what's going on, it becomes like a perpetual negative cycle, and then people really can lose hope. And they say, "How do I fix this?" Because they it. don't have any yeah. skills. And if they, some people, ha if they might have had role models, and that definitely helps. It doesn't always mean that they're, you know. Mm -hmm. But some people really never had a healthy role model. Many people never had a m healthy role model of a love relationship. Mm -hmm. So what are the, what are the, you know, some of the, you know, you, we discussed some of the things that, you know, you help couples during, you know, you know, premarital, um, sessions, but what, what are you trying to avoid during marriage? It's like if the top, um, the top few things that you can say are, you know, what we're trying to attack or that you see as a common occurrence in relationships that, you know, you're hoping to, so one you said was, you know, communication, what 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 other what else are the you're trying to it's help really commu i mean any issue like every single issue that comes up pretty much is communication or let's say handling handling like a dist distress right or handling like a trauma or a loss right so that's different right people do need help with that and that you can't you can't prepare for right right, right. so but I think, again, it's knowing that everyone needs help and you should go for help when that happens. But I, I really mean this, like any issue that comes up really goes back to it. I'm thinking about uh, recently a couple that I had where they had a, a, a very serious problem with their adult child. And the problem, the reason it was hurting them was because she felt blamed by her husband, that he was blaming her for not doing for what a was good going job on parenting. With the child. Okay. Right. But again. And then he and he was and even and this is something really interesting that I teach my couples. This is that, and I, I always use this example. I had a man once who told me I never I haven't criticized my wife in twenty years. She didn't feel that way at all <laughs> because he didn't say it, but she still saw every time that she messed up. She saw his face right with his right. So so it's the same thing with this couple right. So they were fighting about their their adult child, and she felt very blamed by him. So they, it just was tearing them apart. But when we worked on the communication, they were able to handle it a lot better and unite them, you know, so that they could, because they did have the same goal, but they, every time they tried to talk about it, it really blew up. Interesting. Interesting. So me, okay, so let's say, I don't know if this is the case, yeah. but let's say like he's blaming her for specific things that she did and she can't like take them back. Like how... Ne like now what? Like what will be next? It, it's again the way he the way he would say it. If he could speak from a vulnerable way, in a non critical way, acknowledging their differences. Like, well, this was harder for you with parenting, and this was harder for me. And maybe you were home and I was away. And it's like, if you come with the mindset of that, everyone has a good reason for doing what they do, or there's a reason they they're a product of their circumstances. And like, if you come with that in mind and you're not judgmental then you can work together even if i'm sure they both made mistakes what about mm. couples that you know they have really separated they have different completely different ideologies or mm. religious upbringings where mm. oh, and, that's a really good question you know like you know that where to bridge the gap is going to be 
you know, let's say you're sitting on that, you know, that first meeting and you're like, wait a minute, this is not going to be a two session thing. Like it's not, it could, isn't it, are there, there have to be certain things that are much more, you know, challenging that, that even you would say, okay, this needs a specific narrow, like, so how would you deal with something like that? So, right. It's, it's usually never two sessions. <laughs> you, like I said, usually by the time people come in, they're not coming in just for a little tune up. It's usually, unfortunately, you know. I mean, once they've been through therapy, they'll come back for, like, a tune-up, right? right? Wouldn't that be great if, yeah. like, all couples just went yeah. to couples therapy, like, twice yeah. a year? Just yeah, to, like, it would be. Or, like an oil change. It would be so nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because this is what I always say, and I really believe this, uh, that pe- people have this feeling, I need to be super mom, super dad. They're, like, everyone has this, oh, oh, I'm such a great mom, and I have to be a good mom, and there's so much shame with that. But nobody ever says... Why don't I be super wife? And it's it's just as important, if not more important, because that's the foundation of the family. And like I said to you on the phone, mm-hmm. that's impacting future generations. That's the biggest gift you could give your kids is nurturing mm-hmm. your – like I, my kids always say, why are you going on a date? You're already married. I say, because we need to. We need to spend time together without any interruptions. What like? And I tell my couples this, dates – and vacations a couple of times a year. And you can go on a free vacation or, a, you know, it's just about even if you can't go away, you can take off a whole day of work and just spend a day alone. But you, re- it's so important to nurture the relationship, right? It, it, it needs nurturing. Like I heard, I once heard someone say, and it's so true, um, every great marriage takes a great amount of work, right? So the people that you see that look like it's easy, they're working at it. They're thinking about, well, what can I do? thinking about their spouse what can i do to, you know to give oh. right wait so yoni was asking oh, right. about like oh, right. people i think i'm gonna rephrase right. it oh different this religious people right like people right. with literally different right. values right. like different values now what? Like, right. yeah, that's a better word. like it's one thing if you have different interests like she likes ice skating and he right. likes basketball right. but like if you don't have if your values don't align right like does that work like could that work so okay so it could work if they want it to, what I would, I would really, in that case, help them really clarify. First, I would validate how painful it is what they're going through and that we're going to work together, like that we're a team. The three of us are going to work together. It's not like I'm the expert. We're, we're going to get through this and, that, and try to give them hope and really validate that I understand their, what they're going through. And then I'll try to help them clarify that what their goals, what do they really want, right? I've seen people change in the most uh, unbelievable ways if they both wanted to. Like what would you say an example of that is, of change? Uh, like, a, let's say, um, severe addiction, um, infidelity, um, like severe emotional abuse. I've seen people change when they both wanted to change. And I always say this, like, when you start pointing the finger at yourself, you're going to start to change, right? When Because we're... It's always to, if you can't if you if you can't see what you're doing, then and but we frame it in a very non-judgmental way. Like if someone comes in with some kind of a, with an addiction or or really or negative behavior, we usually understand why and we frame it from an attachment lens, like that maybe that person didn't get love as a child or they've been hurt somewhere along the way, and there's a reason that they're doing that. Not that it's okay, but that they're going to be loved right. and helped through it. It's so like a psychoanalysis approach, basically. Well, I don't. I wouldn't call it psychoanalysis, but it was my doctor term. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wrong. I tried. I would call it like that. Just really understanding someone's pain, really trying to understand their pain and see it. Usually, it is from that there's that right. they've been hurt somewhere, and that it's affecting their ability to trust. Got it. So, right. like the well, premarital. Well, most people aren't like evil. Some people are evil. But not I'd most. say most, like I think that's a minority yeah. of people who are actually right. like psychopath evil people, right? So right. If most people, if we think most people are good, got it. Then right. there's always a reason, right, right? Right. So the pre the premarital like um um the premarital you know sessions are really a self awareness. So you right. want to really get to understand yourself. What one one you know what makes you you know, tick or what makes you, what are your, like, attachment, you said? Yeah, attachment. Like, what are your patterns? Patterns. Like your relationship right. patterns. And then right. figure out, you know, what the other person's is and then role play to figure out how to connect with that person in that way so that when you start practicing, you start getting into a zone where, 
you know, you and that person get to that level where you trust each other and there's a vulnerability and a good connection. And we practice like, well, well, do we do exercises of, well, can you bring up something that's hard to talk to your spouse or chassan about, you know, and then, well, why is it hard? What are your thoughts, feelings? Like, what is what does he see when you're in that zone of like disconnection? And we o- we always talk about that, like in couples therapy. What's the what's making you feel disconnected? What's the trigger? What's what's that about? Do you, when you're doing this premarital education, do you have a wide range of people who come in terms yes. of religious level? Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Do you see differences? Well, I think that we're behind in the firm world in terms of recognizing the importance and being okay with it. Right? Important, recognize the importance of what? Of, of premarital education. I think that in, it's kind of more in style in the secular world. Oh, okay, check premarital education. Yeah, like that's cool. That you know, that's like a good thing to do. Right. And I think there's more hesitancy, and that's what we have to work on, right? Because there's a right, stigma, maybe. Why, right? Yeah. Why are we hesitant? Like, what are we worried about? Right. Like, we're worried. Yeah. They're not going to get married. Like it what, seems like a no brainer, doesn't right. it? It's really like a no brainer. I mean, that's also one of the reasons I started this because I started to think that my boys are almost like going to be in shidduchim, and I'm like, what do these twenty one year olds know about marriage? And also because I was seeing, I see a lot of people come in a few months after the wedding. Wow. Well, and so an, another thing for that what I think, reasons? Like, what do right. you? Because I wanted to ask you that. I don't. I don't know if we want to get into this topic, but. The I feel like this is a newer thing. I mean, newer since I got married, not like right. really new, but like the being married for a very short amount of time. Like, so, do you oh, have any insight into why that's happening? Okay, so my insight is anecdotal, but what okay. I think is I was just having this conversation on one of these talks that I think like let's say my parents' generation, a lot of people didn't get divorced and they stayed unhappily married because like let's say I hear this all the time because I do have clients that are 60 70 years old that they called their parents and their parents were like too bad like you have to stay married Mm -hmm. there was so much less education and so like therapy was like there was a stigma so I think that there's a lot more education now about healthy relationships and and also I think that there's less fear I think that most people so, do so try so to make it work. So you're saying that it's a good thing? No, what I'm I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying that I think that I think that there was always dysfunction. Right. <laughs> Fine. So there's definitely a lot more stressors today, right, with internet and the world that we live in. But I don't. I mean, I, I think that there were a lot of unhealthy marriages for different reasons. Right. 40, 50 years ago also. Right, and that percent of, right. of marriages could have ended then, but, you know, because today people are aware that they don't have to stick it out, they... Uh, women were very afraid to leave because they couldn't afford to. Right. A lot right. of women didn't work. Right. right, right. I think that most people really try to make it work. They don't just get divorced. I, I really don't. I think that most people try to make it work. So I don't think that these... I think that those, those extreme cases, they're seeing something that was hidden before they're Mm -hmm. finding out something that they really you know right they would have never went through with it if they would have known and they find it out after so they just quickly and there are shorter engagements right so a lot of shorter yeah there's shorter engagements now than there were like when you were getting married not when i was but but i guess even earlier yeah earlier time yeah interesting so then things can't come out right but people hide things also so it's I, i think that I think that mo- I really think most people really try to make it work. If they do you can. find like this? Can this? Do you find like there are, when you're in your practice that if there's someone who needs to work on something, it's more likely to be the male or the female? Do you see it more likely being the male, or is it an even split? I think it's even. I don't. I don't think it's. No, I don't think it's. What just did you curious. want her to just say? Curious. I mean, what I, I want never, her to I say never was really, the man. I never. Well, look, I was. You know, you hoping it. You know, you never know. If I they say the women, then it's you know not the man. If it's the right. man, it's I the think man. That, yeah. I think not that I'm judging. I'm just curious. Usually, uh, we really look at it as the the relationship is the problem, not one person. That they're, it's what they're triggering in each other. Right. Okay, let me ask another question. Are there, like, common, I guess, topics or things that couples fight about, like, that you see over and over? One is parenting. Okay. It's a big one. Okay. Especially because many people have different parenting styles. 
So how how would that play out? Um, okay, so let me think. That would play out with um, a lot of times parenting disagreements. People will fight. They'll be very reactive in front of their kids, which we try to work right. on that that's not – that they should kind of take a pause and talk about it privately. Um, but I see that as a big trigger where one will criticize the other, one will feel – manage I can handle it and then reject it. it it's a big trigger so that that would be the main one um parenting. finances finances I don't I don't see, see that I, I do see people that have financial difficulties but I don't I mean I know there are people where if there's a major financial loss you do hear you know that you know there's divorce stress but or stress stress but I don't know. I, so I don't, raising kids is a tough one. Yeah, I- illness is a is a is a, is a challenge. One. Oh wow. Yeah, um, a lot of times, in laws. I know. So yeah. I was just gonna yeah. gonna ask about that. Yeah. So you know, I lived. We lived next door to my in laws. Next oh, yeah. door yeah, for four mm-hmm. years. For four years. Wow. Then we moved to Florida. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what? Like what? Like, that's, like, boundary issues? Like, what would be the issues with the yeah. laws? boundaries, definitely. And also, like, let's say one person d- feels, um, let's say one person wants to spend more time with their parents than the other one, or parents giving unsolicited advice, parents, um, you know, financial issues with parents. So how would you approach that? Like, for people listening, could you give any type of practical tip for people who are struggling with that? Because I, right, I yeah. think that's, like, very common. I think, I think it's, that's, it's, it's also, I think it's more common at the beginning, and then people learn how right. to navigate it. Right. I don't see that so much as a trigger why people come to therapy. I right. see that more as, like, a side thing. Got it. Not, like, not the main issue. But I think that that is something that people should get help with. If they see it happening, they should talk to someone. How do you handle it in the right way to be respectful but also have your own boundaries, which is so important. So I, I definitely think that's something that people should get help for. Right, like they get shouldn't a, just try get a to wing it. Yeah, neutral get a, party right, yeah. to help yeah. you like talk this out yeah. and figure out what's going to make sense. Yeah. Interesting. So let's say someone who has, you know, communication you know, they they have to work on their communication. Do you see that as a symptom of the per, like a nature or a nurture? Is it some, because and I'll tell and I'll break down why. Okay. If it's a nature thing, then that's something that they're born with and they'll have to work on. If it's a nurture thing, then what would be keys to help parents? You know, help their kids. Like, let's say I'm a young parent. How do I get my kid to not have that same challenge when he or she is, you know, older? So. I mean, I, I say this a lot, that the skills that we teach in couples therapy are uh, great for parenting skills, right? Validation before advice, right? You give validation before you give advice to your kids, right? You w- try to think about what do they want from me right now? What does this person, what does my child need right now, right? So if you're modeling that, that's the best gift you could give them in terms of them being healthy parents, you modeling what you're like let's say if you're talking about in couples there will be right? this thing I like I would tell my kid I understand that that's frustrating that you can't have another candy <laughs> yeah yeah uh-huh. you're having a yeah. hard time that's good no, yeah. I'm getting there yeah yeah like first yeah. the emotion first figure out what's going I, obviously sometimes you just have to discipline them I'm, I'm not a parenting expert i'm telling you i'm not a parenting expert you're saying this could no this i think it's such a good question like you're right. asking but like, I, how do we show our kids what healthy communication right is so that right. they'll have because you were saying a lot of the attachment style comes from right. childhood right and we have little kids right so we want our kids to have those secure attachments when they go into right. their relationships so you, when I was when I was studying EFT, I remember thinking this is so good for my parenting, also with my kids. Like because sometimes I remember thinking, and I never thought of this before. Like when one of my kids was upset, they just need me to touch them. They just need like me to like you know like let's say just rub them a little bit, help them regulate, show them that I'm there, and not fix. That's a lot of what we teach, like couples, not fixing, listening, right? Like if someone usually if someone's in pain, they don't want advice. 
They, they just mm-hmm. want someone and a connection, ha- knowing that, like, if you think of someone who's going through real suffering, t- what's going to make them feel better? Knowing that they're loved. Like, you can't fix their problems. You, but if they feel that they're loved, it helps a lot. So in terms of your kids, you the same communication that we're talking about with each other, let's say empathy, vulnerability, validation, acceptance, all of the, you know, comfort, belonging, emotional safety. Emotional safety means that they can bring up something and you're not going to get defensive and say, but I just did that. That you're going to say, oh, that's really hard. That sounds really hard. Interesting. I have some videos, but I can't show them uh, on this. But what, like, what was what the videos? Like, there's some really good videos about this. Um, did you ever see the Empathy Short by Brene Brown? Yeah. So that's like yeah. one of my favorites. I, I did not show that to people. <laughs> I, show I show it to couples yeah. and when I'm teaching, and the, it's not about the nail. Right. 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 So yeah. it's not about the nail. The nail. The okay. Yeah. yeah. So in it, okay, and it's not about the nail. So there's a a man and woman talking. And the woman keeps saying how hard it is and how much she's suffering. And then all of a sudden you see there's a nail in her Oh, head. I saw this one. Right, 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 right. And she doesn't want him to take it out, basically. Right. So what I, what I always, when I teach and I show this video, I say, what was the changing moment in that video when he said, that sounds really hard? She melted. And she's like, it is. Thank you. And she gave him a hug and then the nail, you know. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. So I, I don't know. When I saw that, I'm like, she's a little crazy, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it but has she, to be extreme to get the point across. <laughs> right. 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 And with the empathy video by Brene Brown, you said it's amazing. Yeah. So she talks about how she has someone in a hole, and right. then she sh- she um she has a guy saying like, "Oh, you want to say it? You look sad. You want a sandwich?" And then she has, an, and she says that's sympathy, and then empathy. She has somebody coming down mm-hmm. into the hole and say, saying, "Oh, you have seen this, or no, this one oh, I haven't seen." I know that it's mm-hmm. it's dark here, but you're not alone. And then she says at the end, the main thing is that usually what somebody wants is they just want connection. They don't want they don't want someone to solve their problem when they're upset. People will tell you when they want that when they want you to fix or they want solution. Yeah. I guess it's harder, I guess, for, do you feel like it's yeah. harder for yes, guys? Yes, definitely, because, definitely. You know, Most of the time, not always. No, yeah. It's not always that yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I feel like I fall into this. But try, a lot I of times it is harder. And yeah. it also, hap- that's also, it's, it, it depends on it, what, was, what was happening when they were growing up. Like I always ask it to couples when they come in. One of the first questions I say in the individual intake is, did you have anyone to talk to about your feelings when you were a kid? Like did anyone validate your feelings? Usually, they, a lot of times the answer is no. Wow. Wow. So, do you think that'll change now that they're just so much more out there? I think about that, this. I'm. I find yes that like couples, some a lot of the a bunch of the engaged couples that come to me, like they already were reading Gottman and they're right. reading the attachment book. And when I was engaged, nobody was reading any books except for the ones from the Hassan and Kala teacher. Wow. Right. So right. I think that there is more education. So do you use Gottman? In, so in no, your, I don't use. I mean, what's I, Gottman? Yeah, I don't use he, Gottman. They're they're like Orthodox people, no? He wears a yarmulke. Yeah, no? yeah, he, he wears a yeah. It's this couple that. Came yeah, up they, with have a, they, they have a they have their own Gottman therapy approach. Therapy. Yeah, it's, it's a couples cool. therapy. Basically? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's they have a lot of cool yeah. stuff. I, I, I recommend emails. the books. You could sign up for emails. You get yeah. Sometimes I recommend his books. I get their emails. His books are good for couples to read. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of like, no, so the emails I like a lot. I don't know if anyone listening wants to right. sign up for it. They send you like sort of like marriage tips or like right. ideas and they send twice a week. Yeah. You just like read it. It's a quick read and it gives you an idea of like something you could do that day. It's yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've heard him speak. He has done a lot of research. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like the need to, you know, I'm trying to break down this, you know, the, you said something that like I'm trying to, I'm toying with in my mind, the difference between you know, trying to fix something and just giving empathy, right? So, you know, I think it's easy to give empathy to people like that you're not very close with, right? So yeah, I agree with that. So like, but that that's probably not I, empathy. No, but what I'm trying <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like, and I don't, uh, but like, if let's say you see somebody who is suffering or somebody right. that's going through something, you're not like, you're not their wife or your husband or kid or, or, or son or daughter, right? You're, you don't have that relationship or best friend. So you can, you can empathize with them. There's no like, can't explain it. It's a, almost like a one-way 
given. Right, yeah, yeah. But the second, or mm-hmm. not the second, but in the event that it's a two-way where that person means something to you and you see that they're suffering, it's almost like you have this like immediate urge to get them out of being in pain, right? So when you see... When You're a right. person sees their spouse, their their parent, their child, their best friend suffering, right? To just sit there and not get that nail out of that head <laughs> seems like the most insane thing to do. Like it, it's in the video, that's why I always thought it was crazy. It was like, if you saw, God forbid, someone like literally bleeding, you'd be like, I'm really sorry that you're going through like the gushing blood spilling out of your arm. No, you'd be like, you'd rip off your shirt, you'd tear off a thing, you'd cut the, you know, stop the bleeding, and then you deal with the emotion, right? right? So there's this like, this ch- this thing that I'm noticing that when you're that, how do you deal with when you're very close to somebody, mm-hmm. you know, that primal urge, the need to like save that person, how do you like, how do you like stop that? I think you're right. It also, the other part is that when it's someone you care about, their suffering affects you, right? Right. So yes. it's, you're you're definitely not you're definitely biased, which right. is why people go to a therapist so they have an unbiased opinion, right? Because when it affects you, it's also harder. Because let's say that it's really impacting you negatively, mm-hmm. whatever their suffering is. Right. But you're right. I think that this what you're bringing up is really comes up a lot in parenting, right? Because if your kid is suffering. You want to get them out of it. You don't want to just say, I'm so sorry, you're suffering, right? So I think it's just, again, slowing things down, really. Of course, if someone's bleeding, you have to you have to take care of the bleeding while you're showing empathy. You can't just let them bleed out, of course, if there's a crisis. Right. But you can do it in a way where you're showing love. Like, let's say someone who's in an addiction and you need to get them help. You can right. do it in a non-judgmental way where you're showing them that you really care. Reminds me of those like things where you put your finger in and the more you pull out, the more it tightens. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And you have to like, what, what, what is that called? Yeah. It's, it's called like a Chinese Trick. torture or something. It's like, no? a, you know, you know what I'm talking about where they, you the put two, you put your two fingers into a, uh, I don't know what the word is called. I don't know what it's called. It's and called the more chain, you pull it out, yeah, the more you pull out, about. it tightens. And yeah. when you pull in, that's when you push in, that's when it loosens up. It's so like it's counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. Yeah, right. You would think that, you know, when you're dealing with someone that's close with you, you want to help them. And the way to do that is to try fixing it. But really, it's just to give them empathy. Right. It's both, right? Right. Obviously, but, if it's no, an emergency. Also, right. right. Like, there's also a difference, I think, between emotional and medical. Like, sometimes you really can't do anything. Like, you right. can't save a person sometimes. But even if it is something medical, like, the person still wants to feel the love and the warmth. Even mm-hmm. if you have to get them medical help or it's a crisis. They, they don't want you to be, they want you to be, they don't want you to be anxious, right? Like, they're bleeding right. more. They want you to think about them. Right, right. Interesting. That's like, uh, it's very, very interesting. Right. Okay, let me, I'm going to go back to the marriage counseling. Okay, sure. Have you seen marriages that, like, you thought wouldn't make it and then made it? Like, could it give us a, a yes. story, like a good, like, feel-good story? Well, I, I yes, I, I have seen, well, I don't, I don't know if I thought they wouldn't make it, but I didn't, like, a lot of times you just don't know, like, some cases are very severe, but a, a really difficult – I have seen s- some really difficult cases. And, again, what I what I attribute it to is that they were committed to really doing the work, which meant couples therapy and individual therapy. And sometimes if it's an addiction, also a 12-step program. Right. So – it's re- it requires a lot of commitment. It's not like just check, I did therapy, right? Mm. So there's a difference between going to therapy and really doing the work. You need to do both. Right. And also you need to really try to find the right therapist. This, like you have to try to find someone who has experience with your issue because if not, then you'll go a few times and say, I tried it, it didn't work. Which is the other, another thing I try to do with give people hope is that you have to try different people and find someone that can help you. Right, There's hope. right. That has to be spoken yeah, about. Yeah, but I more. have seen right. people. A lot of people give up after one right. therapist. Right. And the, yeah. like when you talk about a case that seems hopeless, so the, this couple really wanted to keep their family together. They just, they were, they just, they, they didn't want to have to split up time with their family. They really wanted to, and um, and it was extremely painful process the therapy because. There was a lot of anger by the one that was abused. 
like verbally abused, it's like, you know, right. emotionally abused. And at first the partner couldn't even sit in the room and, and would have to leave because it was so painful. But eventually he understood that she needed him to go in the mud with her and really understand the pain that he caused. And then she needed to understand his shame. And that's why he kept running out of the room. Wow. And uh, like they just, they really, they did not stop. And they even said, we're going to be in therapy. We might have to be in therapy for life, you know, because of how much trauma. And if you talk about it, think about it. They both had, they didn't have good parents. They didn't have a good, healthy beginning, either of them. And then they came together and then they suffered for many years until they hit rock bottom. Right. So, okay. So that's what I was just thinking right. as you're saying this. What made them come to therapy? Like, do they're just choosing to come? Someone like recommends that this is something they do. Um, so, oh, like, what makes that? Well, right, I like, think what's the rock bottom? Like, what oh, would someone just say? Okay. Like, I'm going. Like, so let's say in this case right. with the, with the woman was being abused. Right. Well, like, verbally, did she, verbally abused. Yeah. Did she say like? come to therapy or else like ultimatum like yeah they decided together she, I, they both realized that they needed they needed it and i think it was a matter of they come gone to a few therapists before they found the eft or before they came to me so they were trying um but they both had already started individual therapy which i think also helped them mm. be ready for therapy but I think it was, yeah, hitting rock bottom could mean, like, someone having to go to rehab because of an addiction, someone getting arrested, um, you know, like, if there's a legal, like, a, you know, the person's doing illegal things. Um, let's say they run, they have no money to pay their bills because one is spending money and hiding it from the other one. Um, or one says, listen, you know, if, if, if you don't go to therapy, sometimes someone will have to say, if we don't go to therapy, this is over. You know, one time I, somebody, a couple, you know, the husband was drinking a lot. And I remember she said to him, you're, you're not allowed to come home, you know, until this stops. Like you have to, you know, because it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't healthy. Right. It was dangerous. It wasn't a healthy situation. And that saying, I, I always say, it's like, you can't make empty threats, but if you really say something that you're going to stick to and you mean it, then it can help. Like if right. you mean we, this, like a lot of times it's not that the marriage has to end, but a part of the marriage has to end. And most people, when they come to therapy, they both feel like, we can't go on like this. We, right. This, And they both feel that way. Right, usually. usually. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Would you ever suggest that a couple doesn't stay together? So it's not my call to make. Um, I do sometimes suggest, like, like, like if there's so much escalation, that they're constantly fighting and it's that they, they don't feel emotionally safe or I'm worried it can turn physical. Like sometimes I'll say, I think it's a good idea to like ha- take a little break one stay somewhere else while you work on it, while you're in therapy, just because I don't feel comfortable with them going home right. from the session. Not even, not even danger, like not even physical safety, more like distress. Like it's extreme anxiety for people to have to constantly be fighting. Right. Right. Um, but divorce, you know, I'll help them understand what they want. Like, I'll help them clarify their, you know, and then support them in either whatever Decision. they decide to do. Right, right, right. Like, back to the values, like, question. Right. Like, if the values are really clashing and they both decide right. it's in their best interest right. to divorce, then you would just support them through that process. Right, exactly, yeah. Right, could, could we try to end with, like, practical tips for married people who are listening okay so let me think about this so okay well i think like one tip is just prioritize your marriage right really nurture your marriage like this is this should be one of your main priorities like give it give like literally like set aside time for this right prioritize your marriage it's 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 the foundation of your family right um Think of your spouse. Do things for your spouse. Show them. This is another thing. They can't read your... It goes both ways. This is one thing I always tell couples. Don't expect your spouse to read your mind. It's never a good idea. Like, I tell my husband exactly what I want for my birthday. And all the occasions, I tell him. I've learned. Like, he doesn't care. I do too. He doesn't (laughs) care. Okay, he doesn't care about birthdays. Uh, he does. He doesn't care about what he eats. He could eat cereal for three meals a day. So he doesn't care about. So there's pros and cons, right? He doesn't care about birthdays. So I tell him I've learned. 
I want you to surprise me and do this. I want this <laughs> present. Right. And it works. It works. I think right. people say all the time, she should know that. No, they don't. shouldn't know that. That's the worst thing. And the other thing is don't expect your marriage to be like the movies. It's com- right. It really hurts people. They, uh, this is a big problem, I have to tell my engaged couples. It's not like the movies. Everything takes work. A good marriage takes work and intentional behavior, thinking of each other. It's very damaging what people see. They really think it's like in the movies, right? right? No, and in the movies also, like, the they always know how to surprise each other and, like, be romantic. And, sing. and they always it's break not... up and get back together, right? right? right. And then they, they get into one fight and get divorced, right? But... There, I, mean, I mean, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say on this. So, like, I've been, like, avoiding no, certain things. You're know? open. Yeah. You're open. The more I, spo- I don't yeah. know. Like, so I've been, you know. We're totally But open. especially when it comes to intimacy. Right. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I should bring that yeah, up. Like, is that something that you're seeing a lot, like, as a big so factor I think in your couples? P- couples need so much education. And a lot of it is because of they assume it's like the movies, that everything is just a perfect, beautiful dance all the time. And they don't realize that every aspect of a marriage takes work. And when I spoke to you before about communication, that's the biggest problem with intimacy. That's pe- not communicating. Right. So what I teach my engaged couples is that you just need to be able to talk about it. You need to be able to talk about everything in a safe way. Share your feelings. Share your thoughts. Don't you know? And and that's what's going to help you have a healthy relationship in all areas right. of your relationship. There's so much fear of talking about things and like people aren't used to talking about their feelings. So you were asking about the main advice. Okay, so don't expect your spouse to read your mind. Then also like I, I was going to talk about this more, but it's like when it, if you're secure and you know that you're sp- – like if you're secure in your attachment and you know that your spouse loves you and you have a secure connection, then you don't have – you don't get defensive, right? You can say openly, this is what I want for my birthday or I want to go here or why did you do that? That hurt my feelings. If you don't have the secure attachment, then everything is like, well, maybe he's going to be upset at me. Maybe she's going to be upset at me. I can't say this. That I already see with the engaged couples. So it's they're already oh, bringing wow. it up, right. afraid to talk about things, afraid well, to share wanna, feelings. They don't want to break the uh, engagement. Right, but that means it's not secure. Right? And, if and you're it, scared to bring something up because you're going to break the engagement, that means that no, but you I don't have a secure attachment with that person I, you're engaged to. But if I you did, you, wouldn't, you would bring it up. Got I it. think it's also, though, that they're too new in their relationship. Right. It's not necessarily, you know, th- also that's going to build over time. You just have to be going in the right direction. Like if you've only known each other for a few months, right? right? So that's the problem. They, someone has to teach them that. You're going to get upset at each other. You, it's going to be hard to talk about things. This is, this is what helps. Don't be critical. You know, when you're sharing a complaint, don't be critical. You know, acknowledge your differences. Well, I came from this kind of family where this is important and you came from this, so we'll figure it out, you know? Like acknowledge differences. And again, I would say the ABCs. Um, acceptance, belonging, comfort, and safety, to remember that, that that's what creates a secure attachment. And then the other thing is that we always say when we're teaching couples listening skills, it's A-R-E, accept, uh, accessible, responsive, and engaged, right? So you, you want to be accessible, responsive, and engaged. You want to show your listening, ask questions, show that you're curious. Like with your kids also, you want to be curious. You don't want to be like, oh, you had a bad day? Okay, you want dinner? Like, right. oh, what happened? Mm-hmm. Right. You want to ask, right? Right. But right. I think a positive way to end is there's so much hope. We just have to work on things, learn, ask for help. Right. There's a lot out there. We're much stronger when we get help. Right. Right. Are we're you, not supposed to be alone. Like we're meant to. We're meant to be in relationships. Right. It's a work in progress. We're meant so. to be right. interdependent. Like dependent, but also we do need other people. Right. Right. To function better. Like when someone has a secure attachment, they function better in all aspects of their lives. Work, everything, health. They're just, right. they're of less course. anxious. Right. Of course. And um, touch is really important also. Are you getting backing from Rabbanim for this idea? Yes. Because... Like, like That's even a good just question. In, in terms of the intimacy piece to like talk about that together with, I mean, I think it's great. Right. <laughs> but are like other rabbanim okay, like so really backing this 
initiative? Yeah, so that's a good question. That is a big, that's a big part of what we're going to have to do. So I started with the YU Rabbanim because that's who I, my husband's Rabbanim, right? And they were on board. And what I told them is, is that for from couples, I'm going to do that after the wedding. Like I'm going to split it up, talk before. I'm going to meet with them a few times before and a few times after. But that they, what I'll tell them is before the wedding, if you need more information than your Hassan and Kala teacher is giving you, she can come to me and he can go to a male therapist. And what I do tell them before is that about the emotional safety connection to physical intimacy. That I tell them before. But right. we do have to get Rabbanim on board. And like I had a woman from a Hasidish community call me that she wants, okay, so this is another part. I'm running a training to train more premarital therapists in the from world. The woman that trained me, they're EFT trainers, so they go around the world to teach couples therapists. I asked them if they would do a course just for the from community. So therapists, Kala teachers, educators can take this course because what eventually what all the Rabbanim are on board, we need an infrastructure of therapists that can teach or, or educators. So um, so I had a woman from, from the Hasidish community call me and we were trying to figure out a way because so we said like we, we, we were talking on the phone that her and her husband can both take the course. She could teach the woman, he could teach mm-hmm. the men. They're not gonna they're not gonna come together. Right. A man won't go to a woman unless it's therapy. The other part is that let's say if someone's Hasidish, I would do it after the wedding, all of it. If a couple is so, let's say, to the right that they're not comfortable sitting together before the wedding, that's fine. We'll do it after the wedding. Right. You know, as long as it's part of the process that the Masa- – I want, like, the Masadri Kedushin to say, oh, I'm marrying you. Did you go to chassan classes? Did you go to premarital education? It, they're love equally it. as important. I right. It's, it. like, it's like it's like a, basically like a license. Like almost you get a driver's right. license. You get a – You get a uh, – You get a, training you get a for a job. <laughs> training for like a no job. Like no one will go to a job without training, and this is like the most important part of your life. Right. right. Right, you sense. know, all of my friends tell me, like when I talk about this, because I talk about this a lot, <laughs> my kids are really sick of My kids could tell you all the research about premarital education. So um, what Watch all them not my go. friends, all, <laughs> <laughs> all of my friends say, I wish we had this. Like right. all happily married, couples that are married for many years, I wish we had this. Like one of my friends even just said to me, yeah, I was so bossy to my husband when we got married, you know. Right. Like they all say, right. my husband really needed this. Like. It's a no-brainer. Like right. this, we we all like we, like I think parents today are very nervous about their kids getting married, so right. set them up for success. Right, like why and, should they have to flounder and like figure it out for years when you could like start and that's off a, with a good foundation? Right, and that's another thing that I see that I think is so important. Parents have to be involved in the shidduch process. They have to spend time with the chassan or kala before because before I, they get engaged before they get engaged and when yeah. they're engaged you could still break off an engagement easily yeah. you know yeah when i hear someone has a broken engagement i i say i'm, I'm better now oh for sure i mean right. so i think that parents just really have to be involved and a lot and like i see a problem i've seen a theme in couples that that when the kids got engaged far away from the parents and the parents didn't even meet oh, or wow. Or like a kid made a major life change, got engaged away from the parents, and like, I just think it's the much parents, more challenging. Parents right. need to be involved. Right. People are biased. The parents know right. more. They have the life experience. So, well, on the other hand, it could be right. a problem. It could, right, it could be. Or, or it some people, relatives. Way. Maybe you have a grandparent or aunt and uncle. Basically, a second someone, set of someone eyes. You trust, basically. Someone yes. you trust. Someone you trust. Right. 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 You, uh, hopefully, second usually opinion. Right. Parents, Not to just but... meet for five minutes, but to really spend time with the right. person. Right. Because to know that you. are the person in the relationship right then is is biased. Right. So like maybe you like could be right. blindsided. And I think it is hard when someone makes a major life change and then gets engaged right away. Like I think people just have to like slow down a little bit, right? Right. Wanna, so what do you mean by that? Like it's like changing their religious level? Yeah, yeah. And then getting engaged right away. Like I think you just like, It makes it more challenging. It makes it more challenging. Right. 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 That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So you're not even like used to how you yourself like right exactly you are, and then right right right, right. You're putting and like if you're there. rejecting where you came from and then you're like well of course this is going to be different we're going to because i'm doing it the different way than my parents you know so, so like you, so you you get a lot of folks who come to you they 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 try the training do they realize that there's something they need to work on deep down before and then they they tackle that like is that how you did basically take each uh, couple like you go down the road of like try to communicate, then they are more aware of what they're, you know, what they need to work on. And then they have a path on what they need to, you know, focus on during the marriage or on themselves. Yeah. 
they understand their cycle. Like, you know, do they withdraw? Do they pursue? And they figure out why they do that, and then yeah. they get into figure out how to. Yeah, and not sometimes do that. they'll decide to get help. Like they'll say, "Oh yeah," uh, or yeah. I'll recommend that. You'll you recommend know? the next. Yeah. Stage, which is like, okay, work on. Right. That next piece. Right. And then you see these couples later, and they're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. This was so like interesting. Thank Way you for having me. Yeah. yeah no, like great. I really hope that we can yeah. get this message more. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed that episode. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, My wife and I actually did some marital prep uh, before we were married when we were engaged. I think uh, with Dr. Edel is his name. And um, it it was great. It was was a breath of fresh air. And of course, you never really know what marriage is like until you actually get married. But any little bit of work you could do before is so helpful. And like many of us know, being in a marriage... It, it's work. It's exciting. It's the best. It's beautiful, but it takes work. So the more we could fine tune our skills and our communications, just the better. Um, and I just want to let anyone know that if you're having any issues in marriage or really any mental health issues, you could call Relief. Their number is 718-431-9501, or you could go on reliefhelp.org and you can find more info there. They are incredible. They will hear you out, hear what you need, and peer you together with the proper person to really help you navigate whatever challenges you're going through. And also, exciting news, That's an Issue podcast is now a phone number. Yeah, for those listening. I mean, if you're listening or watching this, you're clearly on YouTube or Apple or Spotify. But we all have those cousins in Lakewood or just people who maybe don't have a smartphone that want to enjoy this content. And they can enjoy anything on Living L'Chaim. And all they got to do is call 712-432-3489. That is the Living L'Chaim number. And you could listen to all the episodes of That's an Issue there. Until next time, stay safe. Living L'Chaim.